The Tandy 1000, the story of how Tandy beat IBM at their own game. Hello and welcome to Tandy Lab. Today, we're covering, of course, the legendary Tandy 1000, the computer we know and love. Let's look at where Tandy was at leading up to the November 1984 release of the Tandy 1000. Tandy was one of the earliest players in the computer industry, releasing their TRS-80 computer in 1977. This machine was incredibly important as it was the first major computer release that came as a pre-assembled system sold in major retail stores. Since Tandy owned Radio Shack, they had infinitely more control over how their system was sold than any other brand. Even better, their loyal customer base were the exact type of people who were excited to be early adopters of this new technology. In 1980, Tandy made even bigger strides with the release of the TRS-80 color computer. This system was designed as an approachable computer for the everyman, connecting directly to the owner's television. In November 1983, the Tandy 2000 would be released. This system was a major step forward for Tandy as it was Tandy's first attempt at an MS-DOS compatible computer. Unfortunately for them, it would become a pretty major failure due to not being fully IBM compatible. We recently picked up a Tandy 2000, so I'm looking forward to telling its full story in the near future, so stay tuned for that. While Tandy was developing the 2000, IBM announced their PC Junior, a mostly IBM compatible computer designed for the home user. IBM releasing a home system with the power of the PC's 8086 CPU, with enhanced graphics and sound, and a lower price tag really generated some hype, and Tandy began working on a clone of the system even before it came out. As it turns out, the PC Junior was a pretty embarrassing failure for IBM. As I covered in our full video on it, there were a lot of problems from a high price tag, to a lack of compatibility, to a pitiful amount of onboard RAM, to one of the worst keyboards ever designed. So what do you do when the computer that your team has spent a year cloning turns out to be a massive failure? Do you shut the project down? Or do you do what Tandy did and fix pretty much all of the original system's issues while making it even better and even making the system cheaper? The Tandy 1000 would be released in November of 1984. It was marketed as a better PC Junior at first, but Tandy quickly changed their strategy to selling it as a better PC, period. The Tandy 1000 would become a major success for Tandy, not just because of its great hardware, but also due to the key advantage of selling in Radio Shack stores. IBM had to work with hundreds of third-party vendors to sell their systems, and in particular, they really struggled with selling to consumers. Tandy, on the other hand, had years of experience selling computers to normal people and could advertise their legendary customer service and could offer installations of upgrades in store, which was a major selling point. You also can't discount the fact that Radio Shack was already optimized for installment payments. Dropping over $1,000 at once for a computer was a big ask, but $50 a month? Much more reasonable for many people. The case Tandy used was interesting. It's a similar form factor to the PC, but using the softer, rounded, inviting aesthetics of the PC Junior. The 1000 would remove a lot of the less necessary features of the PC Junior. Notably, the ROM cartridge ports, wireless keyboard feature, and replacing IBM's cool but imperfect sidecar expansion system with industry standard 8-bit XTISA slots. Though the implementation wasn't perfect, since full-size 13-inch cards didn't actually fit in the 1000's case, limiting the use of some cards, particularly older ones. The 1000 launched with 128K of RAM standard, with upgrades to 256K being available with purchase. Nowadays, it's quite easy to upgrade to the maximum of 640K. That's a big benefit since RAM limits really hindered the PC Junior. One interesting decision Tandy made was using peripheral ports that were holdovers 
from the TRS-80 and Coco lines, rather than using the same ports as IBM. This might seem a bit strange, but it was actually a pretty smart move as it simplified what peripherals Tandy had to stock in stores greatly and offered a nice incentive of keeping your old peripherals to those upgrading to the new platform. Now, one area I'm not really a fan of is Tandy's use of a proprietary edge connector for a printer connection, rather than the near universal DB25 printer port. You could still connect a standard printer, but you'll need to buy a special cable from Tandy. Taking a page out of Apple's book right there. The 1000 uses a keyboard pretty similar to the one used with the Tandy 2000. It's one of the first IBM compatible keyboards to move the function keys from the side to the top of the keyboard. It's also an early example of this now iconic shape of arrow keys. Though they are a bit annoying because they aren't separated from other keys, making it easy to press something by mistake when using the arrow keys while gaming. Of particular annoyance is the hold key located right above the up key which pauses the entire computer when pressed. Not a great design. As for quality, the keyboard is okay. It's a bit cheap feeling, but it gets the job done. I'd certainly take it over either keyboard from the PC Junior, that's for sure. Bundled with the Tandy 1000 was DeskMate, a graphical software environment originally written for the TRS-80 line. While it might look quite rudimentary now, it was pretty advanced for the time. Utilizing the 1016 color high resolution mode, you had a quality program that offered the home user features like a calendar, a drawing program, a word processor, and more. It really was a great idea for DeskMate to be one of the big selling points for the Tandy 1000. It was something you could only get by choosing Tandy and it was a great piece of software for small businesses and families. While you could connect the Tandy 1000 to a TV using its composite output, the additional purchase of a monitor was becoming pretty common. Tandy offered two primary monitor options to match the Tandy 1000. Both used the 1000's TTL RGB connector. They were the CM5 and CM11. Both were 13 inch monitors with the CM11 having a lower dot pitch for a much sharper image. Tandy also offered monochrome monitors for those looking to use the 1000 as a text only machine. Tandy would release a minor refresh to the 1000 with the 1000A. This model fixed some bugs with the 1000 and added a slot for an 8087 math coprocessor. The 1000A also can scan its expansion slots for a bootable ROM something the original model lacked. There's also the Tandy 1000 HD, which despite being considered a separate model, it's really just a Tandy 1000 with a factory installed hard disk in either 10 or 20 megabyte capacities. The Tandy 1000 was received very warmly by the tech journalists of the time, with many calling it, the system that the PC Junior should have been. It was praised for being a very well-built machine with all the benefits of both the PC Junior and a PC with none of the PC Junior's downsides and without the astronomical pricing of a real PC. The 1000 would be so successful that the advanced graphics and sound that the PC Junior pioneered would be known as TGA or Tandy Mode from then on. Ouch. The PC Junior would be discontinued just three months after the release of the 1000. IBM would never succeed in the lucrative home PC market. Meanwhile, Tandy would remain one of the biggest players for the next decade. The 1000 would evolve into a full line of computers with a direct successor to the 1000, the Tandy 1000 SX, being released in 1986. Tandy would continue to sell existing stock of the 1000 for several years after that, however. And now for the ratings. First, usability, four out of five. Accessories for the 1000 are fairly common and remain cheap. One of the best features of the 1000 is its video options. Having both a composite output and TTL RGB is basically the best combination of video outputs on any 80s computer. It even offers an audio out jack for easy audio recording. Rarity, 
three out of five. The Tandy 1000 is a fairly common system due to how well it's sold and the fact that its build quality is fantastic, keeping the vast majority of systems still running today. Price, two out of five. Being the start of a major computer line with an avid fan base to this day, the 1000 has become a pretty expensive collector's piece. It's still worth it though. Aesthetics, three out of five. It's a good looking system and it doesn't tend to discolor too much over time. Still, it's not anything special. Software, four out of five. The Tandy 1000 is one of the absolute best systems to buy if you are interested in using a full featured PC compatible from the 80s. However, it may be worth it to spring for an upgraded 1000 SX or TX instead. Well, that's all for you guys today. Make sure to like this video and subscribe, please. We are on a quest to document the history of every single Tandy computer ever made. And I'd love for your advice on which one we should cover next. Make sure to uh, join our Discord server where you can talk to me about this lovely computer or any other computer. And uh, I'll see you guys next time.